I want to say, first of all, talofa to you all. Talofa. And then to express my respects to the uh, ancestral uh, leaders of the land and also to the leaders of the university, the National, Australian National University. And thank you very much indeed for being here. I bring warm greetings from the people of Tuvalu. They are still there. <laughs> they are still there in Tuvalu. And it is a great honor, uh, Sir, Director of Climate Change, uh, Institute in the Australian National University for your welcome uh, and a privilege uh, for me to be speaking here at the ANU. I particularly want to thank the Climate Change Institute, Director of course, the Ferner School and I understand also the Pacific Institute uh, of the ANU for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Tuvalu as you may uh, already know, has a long-standing relationship with the ANU because we have a number of Tuvaluan students and Pacific students studying at the ANU and some I can see, uh, also uh, even see in the audience. I just came out of uh, a Talanoa or a dialogue with our fellow Pacific uh, uh, students and including Tuvaluan students uh, where I got all decorated with flowers and, uh, and uh, also with a garland. So uh, that's why you, you see me in wearing the lace and the flowers. But I have with me a delegation comprising the CEO of Foreign Affairs, um, Fakavai Taumia, my personal assistant in the office of the Prime Minister, and Her Excellency, the newly accredited uh, Resident High Commissioner of Australia, Tutu Valu, uh, Miss Murray, who you can see there. But uh, we have had particular relationship, as I was saying, with uh, Ferner School, my director of climate change negotiations, Ambassador Yan uh, uh, Fry, Dr. Yan Fry, as you may know, is a graduate of Ferner School. And he's also our chief negotiator or advisor to our negotiators on the process of uh, climate change. Um, as you may know, he's not here because he's really engaged in negotiations in Poland right now. So you must be very happy he's a graduate of this uh, very important, prestigious university. I understand also he's, uh, together with other uh, colleagues, graduates from, graduates from here, have uh, are teaching in schools here in, in the ANU. Others uh, who have graduated from the ANU on diplomacy, on public policy, uh, have uh, returned to Tuvalu and have made significant contribution to helping the, the small island administration in, in develop its policy, but also on development uh, issues as well, as uh, participating or contributing in the foreign service of Tuvalu. So, we need, uh, uh, we believe, to continue these special relationships and uh, for our, our, our small island countries with little capacity in areas of policy and development. Uh, it is uh, critical and important, in my view, that this special relationship uh, continue. So maybe later on I will explore some options how we can move this forward. But on this issue of climate change, it is very clear that it is the serious single greatest threat to humanity that we face today. We have acknowledged uh, amongst the leaders of the Pacific in the Boe Declaration on, on Security in the region, as we agreed in, in the last forum or meeting of the for leaders in Nauru last year. And again, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial levels, highlights profound global risks that we are facing. The report concludes that the effects of human-induced climate change are worse than previously projected, and that the risks to Pacific small island developing states are very, very serious, including my own Tuvalu. We face particular threats to our coastal and marine 
environment, including sea level rise, extreme weather events, coral bleaching, ocean acidification, and changes in fish stocks. It is therefore a threat to our scenic uh, fisheries, water resources, health, agriculture, tourism, and many other fronts. It is very evident that climate change represents the single greatest threat to the livelihoods of the people living on low-lying, vulnerable island countries. Their security, long-term sustainability, and well-being. I have seen recent reports in various newspapers suggesting that Tuvalu is not sinking and that climate change is a hoax. This is a little bit unfortunate. I have seen reports of politicians making uh, also similar statements. And they refer in particular to a paper by uh, authors Richard uh, Kench and Arthur Webb which suggests that Tuvalu has increased in size since the Second World War. My own scientists and through empirical observations on the islands, including experts from uh, ANU, have critiqued this paper and believe that the findings are at best misleading. We all know that the coral arrows, uh, atolls grow and shrink due to various factors. And to suggest a trend of growth is, I believe, simply poor science. Even a layman like myself knows that, and through observations, that this is a hoax. We need to visit our islands in Tuvalu. And therefore, we have tidal records going back many decades. And it is clear from these records that the sea is rising around Tuvalu. We are slowly being inundated by seawater. And saying that, the biggest immediate threat to Tuvalu is overwashing from storm surges. For example, in 2015, Cyclone Pam which devastated large parts of Vanuatu, as you may have heard or learned from the media, also had severe effect on Tuval. Our northern islands were confronted with waves ranging from three to seven meters high. As high as point of our entire country is only four meters above sea level, you can start to imagine the effects of such a storm and those surges on the livelihoods of the people. Waves washed across the entire islands and thankfully no lives were lost, but the damage to crops, to food crops, and to livelihoods, to houses, livestock and infrastructure were enormous. Not only was Vanuatu impacted, and we, we feel for our brothers and sisters in Vanuatu for the damages that were inflicted upon them by tropical cyclone Pam, but Tuvalu and many other southern islands of Kiribati were also affect, badly affected. So therefore, the food and water security of those islands destroyed in one single event. It was an enormous hit to our GDP as we had to ship in water food, and other supplies. We are still making payments to help those affected, the landowners, the household owners, the parents, to recover from these damages. We thank the response of the, 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 the global community, and uh, including Australia, of course, helping us to cope and restore our lives. So therefore, because of these events, I, it led me to suggest a strategy, the Kakenga Toru, that is based on regarding the vulnerability to impacts of climate change as enemy number one of Tuvalu, and the critical importance of building resilience, resilience to, so that the people will be able to cope better in the future. 
And that resilience will include uh, education, capacity building, governance, and, uh, and that uh, likely uh, policy orientation to strengthen the ability of the Tuvalu people to respond to those things in the future. So that we didn't have to rely on the goodwill of the international community, but the people will be able to fend for themselves. I also established a, a, what we now call the Tuvalu Survival Trust Fund out of our own resources, dedicating, dedicated an annual part of annual, uh, a portion of our annual budget into this fund so that it can be possibly a future mechanism for insurance cover in the future if we can work with partnerships around the Pacific and other part partners as well. Uh, therefore, it is a view to also propose that because of the, these events, it is relevant that we develop, we establish what I, I refer to as the Pacific Island Climate Change Insurance Facility to give an injection of financial support for these vulnerable island countries. The idea is being well developed and, uh, and received in the Pacific Island Leaders Forum uh, process. It's being looked at by experts from all over the world, including the SPREP, the Forum Secretariat, and I hope that the ANU could look at and offer some suggestions how we can move this from a concept into an, uh, an establishment that can be set with the help of the GCF as well to help the countries in the Pacific. So I say that particularly to the climate change uh, skeptics and politicians, uh, of course, we have seen a lot of media about these, uh, the, the shock jocks and people like who deny climate change that probably it's good if you visit Tuvalu, come and visit Tuvalu and see for yourself what climate change and sea level rise really mean to the livelihood of people who live on places hardly four meters above sea level. I know there have been a lot of talk, a lot of skepticism, and even suggestions that probably it's cheaper to relocate and take these people away from their islands and, be, and resettle them in other parts of the world. I say this is not on. It is not on the agenda of uh, the people of Tuvalu. They want to continue to stay and they want to continue to save their future. And that's why we always say, save Tuvalu in order, in order to save the world. So I, that, that's the invitation there. If you want to really prove that the skeptics are wrong in their forecast, and of course, I know they are paid by the fossil fuel industry to write stories to deny the science and the impacts of low-lying islands like Tuvalu you come to Tuvalu and see for yourself. The occasion of the, having the forum next year in Tuvalu, I think it's a good opportunity for skeptics to come and see for yourselves. Climate change is ever present in our minds and this is why after a visit this time to Australia, I'm heading off to Poland uh, so that we can talk more how we can progress the work on addressing climate change, particularly the work on implementing the Paris Agreement. We have made significant achievement in agreeing to work together under the Paris Agreement, but we need to deliver on this agreement. We cannot just keep the agreement shelved away as another record of commitments, but we need a rule book for this. We need an operational guidelines how we parties and all members of the global community, governments, civil societies, private sectors, businesses, can work together to deliver on the expectations of the Paris Agreement. And we need to find ways to achieve the targets of 1.5 degrees Celsius before 
uh, pre-industrial uh, period. And this is serious. When we look at the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees, it is telling us if no actions are done urgently to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a global level, the situation, the catastrophe impacts on small islands like Tuvalu will be dire will be dire, will be catastrophic. These islands will be submerged within 30 years. Just imagine. Imagine that you were in my shoes. You were wearing my, sho in my, uh, my shoes. And to think about the security and survival of your people being predicted. This is a generation, a mere generation away. A mere generation away. So I think it is onerous on, on all humanity, nations of the world, stakeholders, parties, to come together and take this report seriously. Because it would be, I think, unfortunate if we didn't meet or take actions to address these warnings. I believe that a comprehensive approach to the Paris Agreement rule be rule book is necessary and that it should be a complete package on the implementation of all elements of the Paris Agreement, including on the loss and damage. Loss and damage was put there deliberately to address the issue when your islands or country is completely eroded, you have nothing to adapt to. You have no way to adapt to these impacts such as the small islands, countries of Tuvalu, but all other economies as well. And therefore, it is critical that we work out the rule books how we can implement this practically in a meaningful way. We, of course, are appreciative that there is goodwill still um, on many parties, on the part of many parties, to come together in uh, Poland so that we work out how we can move forward on this. And of course, the other expectation out of uh, COP24 in Poland is for the Talanoa process, which is uh, an initiative that was proposed under Prime Minister Frank Bainimarama of Fiji during his presidency to talk openly about meeting the targets, the nationally determined contributions to global emission reductions. And unless we have a conclusive, concrete decision in Poland, COP24, on moving forward on this, it would be, it would be I think, uh, not helpful at all in order to avoid the catastrophic um, effects as I was referring uh, to earlier on. So these are the expectations that we, I strongly believe we need to work on. So uh, there is another issue as well that I want to, to share, and this is about market mechanisms that are being proposed. While we work on the rule book and the conclusion of the Talanoa process, we need to be weary that the mechanisms for market, uh, for carbon trading, uh, will not be used as an excuse to shift and transfer responsibility from the domestic uh, level to, to other processes. If we were to do that, if it could be used as a mechanism, it should be followed, accompanied by an international uh, monitoring uh, mechanism that can keep check on the integrity and the credibility and contribution as well to the overall <laughs> greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So therefore, uh, in this respect, I have raised the issues uh, together uh, with our, our colleagues, the leaders of the Australian government, and during the day we had a very constructive discussion uh, on these uh, issues, and also shared with Prime Minister uh, Scott Morrison my expectations uh, for, for us to continue to work in close partnership. Of course, uh, uh, sharing with the pre uh, Prime Minister and other leaders that 
whilst we recognise the policies of the Australian government on market uh, mechanisms, and we also uh, need to keep in, in track the issues of integrity and that sort of things as well. So I also want to uh, impress on the presidencies of the COP, Fiji and Poland, to uh, ensure that the outcome of the Talanoa dialogue, as I was saying, would come to some sort of decisions, uh, clear, clearly uh, demarcated in Poland, so that we keep tracks of what people are doing in meeting with the emission reduction uh, targets. We are aware that uh, we are falling far short of meeting the targets that are necessary to to reach the keep to the to the overall global targets of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So therefore, I have impressed on on our friends in in the Australian government, and likewise to all other nations to really think seriously about this. And I'm I'm glad there is there is a, a receptiveness on the part of the Australian government that we continue the dialogue uh, together with the Australian leaders and the Pacific Island leaders, find ways how we can converge a common strength, common uh, position to address this. It is also important that I, I think OECD countries uh, should quickly uh, look at their, their targets as well as their economy so that we can uh, reach their respective countries uh, in achieving the targets of the Paris Agreement. So during this visit to Australia, and I want to acknowledge again my appreciation to the government of Australia for their ongoing support to small islands like Tuvalu, and particularly for their invitation to come and dialogue more on their step up policy uh, for the Pacific Island nations, including Tuvalu, I, I have expressed my views that if there were no efforts to strategically and significantly improve the policy on energy, to move away from coal mining, maybe facing out the coal mining uh, uh, policy, but moving towards renewable energy, it, to me, we it's, it's almost a policy that's con condemning a lot of lives of the people of the Pacific, including Tuva. So, because I strongly believe we need to act uh, together as urgently as possible. Otherwise, the people will suffer significantly as what the IPCC report is projecting. So uh, it never uh, ceases, as I was expressing this afternoon, Prime Minister Morrison, um, Australia is a land endowed with uh, solar and a lot of uh, talents as well, and the expertise, including those in the ANU, who, who are very, very progressive and advanced in looking at options of renewable energy and to move away from the coal-dependent industry uh, economy. And I, I certainly hope my message got there, because when I, I mentioned this, I got uh, Prime Minister was quite happy to receive these comments as well. And I have suggested maybe as a way forward, uh, uh, the Prime Minister and leaders of the Australian government could agree to establishing a, some sort of annual dialogue between the leaders of the Pacific and Australia so that we can come together and talk about common grounds to advance our work on climate change. We, in, for, in the forum last year in Nauru, we spoke and uh, committed to what we now called the Boyer Declaration on Human Security. And I think the Boyer Declaration on Human Security, not only focusing on, on uh, what was espoused under the Pikitawa uh, Declaration on Security, but moving beyond the traditional meaning of security to include human security in the Pacific. So I think this is a very good framework and platform for us in the Pacific 
to seriously look at ways we can uh, develop our capacity to work together to address security issues, including climate change in the Pacific. I have also suggested uh, the support of the Australian government uh, to us in our initiatives to the United Nations uh, on uh, a Pacific insurance and a climate change insurance facility and also a resolution to take care of the rights of people to be displaced by impacts of climate change. I certainly hope the Australian government can stand and help with us in those initiatives. This being uh, said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is also critical in our own country that we develop our sustainable financial capacity to help our people adapt uh, to the impacts of climate change, including um, education, health, and also uh, food security. Harvesting fisheries resources in our vast oceans, therefore, is critical. And, uh, and that's why we are very grateful for the components of the Step Up initiative by the Australian government under Prime Minister Scott Morrison. And uh, we're very happy. Tomorrow I'm going to Perth to see a new naval boat uh, that is to be donated by the Australian government under the Step Up uh, initiative to help Tuvalu patrol its maritime and fisheries resources. Now I think this is uh, very, very critical and timely as we try to maximize the value of tuna and fisheries resource in the Tuvalu EZ. So, Excellencies, these gestures of goodwill are quite important as we move forward. But as I was saying, we need to build the capacity of the local people in Tuvalu and other small island countries and for that, we greatly appreciate the Step Up uh, initiative, building on, on the infrastructure, the resources, work schemes, but also the capacity of our local people. So um, finally, uh, Excellencies, as I was saying earlier on, I want to throw an, uh, some suggestions for further collaboration between the ANU and Tuvalu. Uh, for example, first we, we should continue to build the capacity of our people. So if you are looking for scholarships, offering scholarships and training, uh, Tuvalu is more than happy to provide the students or potential students to come and study in ANU. I think we also uh, need to have set ourselves very serious renewable energy targets and we need the help of ANU to uh, help us move forward with our reaching our targets on renewable energy. And renewable energy is really to, to deal with uh, the issue of high costs of depending on fossil fuels. I think I've already uh, referred to an insurance facility for Tuvalu, and I certainly uh, believe that the Australian uh, government and others will help us uh, move and support us push this initiative not only in the region, but also in the UN. I know uh, my ambassador, ambassador for climate change, has held uh, preliminary discussions with the Climate Change Institute and Crawford School on this, and I hope we can further develop. Uh, let me uh, close by saying I would uh, thank you very much for your time to listen to me. And as you know, Tuvalu is uh, one of the smallest island countries in the Pacific and the world, and therefore we look at the Pacific as uh, needing to work together, particularly to address the issue of climate change. So in closing, thank you again for your partnership and your support, and I think given the significance of the impacts and the threats on the survival of island countries like Tuvalu, we cannot be ignored. If we save Tuvalu, we can save the world. Thank you very much for listening. Tuvalu Modiatua. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that uh, fantastic speech. In fact, it was so fantastic that you've actually covered all of the questions that I was going to ask, <laughs> I'm asking, including the one about how I and you could uh, help oh, okay. in practical ways. <laughs> Thank you very much. But perhaps um, just before I open to the audience, um, just one thing perhaps you could ex expand upon. Um, you mentioned the importance of uh, a new dimension of security, that's uh, human security. Uh, and in particular, I, I imagine your, uh, the idea of uh, climate change refugees is important in terms of your framing of this. Could you just expand a little bit about what you'd like to see happening in that domain? Well, we uh, still believe that uh, those to be displaced by effects of climate change uh, do not fall into the conventional uh, definition of refugees. I, and there will be uh, significant difficulties in accepting this uh, category of people. Because uh, also about the protection of their rights, should they be forced to be relocated uh, within countries, but especially outside countries. So we believe there, there is a, a security dimension to that that requires um, proper consideration at the UN level, global level, for a, 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 an appropriate framework to deal with their rights so that when they are displaced and be relocated, their rights of to survive, you know, to survival and to basic uh, services of water and health are properly are protected. They, that they are not, you know, overshadowed by the ongoing debate on refugees under the 1951 Convention of Refugees. So that's how we, we look at it. It is really a security uh, issue for those who are very, very vulnerable to the effects of climate change, including sea level rise. So we are proposing that uh, uh, UN resolution, we will be tabling it in the UN in next month, in this month in December. Hopefully it will be picked up in the negotiations early part of next year, possibly going to the Human Rights Council and, and the appropriate agencies of the UN. But that's what we are looking at. Mm, thank you. Mm. Um, so just opening the um, floor to questions. Questions for the Prime Minister. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I have a question. Um, I work with the UN Migration Agency here. And uh, you mentioned uh, some sort of a framework or action on supporting disaster-induced displacement. Um, and I think South America this week recently passed uh, a non-binding document. And they look at regular um, legal ways and exceptional <coughs> legal ways to find a way to work together to support international relocation of IDPs related to disasters. Can you speak a little bit more about what are some things um, that could be done in the Pacific and where Tuvalu might be interested in leading? Yeah, absolutely. No, th as I was mentioning, um, uh, these, uh, there are natural disasters that are happening. We have to accept that uh, in the definitions of the Sendai uh, Framework uh, Convention on uh, Natural Disasters. Here we are dealing with the effects of climate change. And, and people have been saying, uh, what are you going, uh, do you have any plan B? To respond to climate change, I said no, there is only one plan, and that is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we reach our targets in the Paris Agreement. When things happen, you know, in the doorstep that devastate, there's another level of this is disasters itself. But we are dealing with a human induced uh, climate change um, that we have to really contain the definition and uh, projection and understanding of it so that we don't you know, unnecessarily move to other um, regime. But we know the effects are basically the same. But in order to, uh, to be comprehensive and you know, move forward in addressing this, uh, particularly to, uh, on climate change, we really need to, to project this is in the human, human induced uh, disaster that we are dealing with. And that's what we are, are trying to do in uh, Tuvalu. 
uh, we we are getting funding from the greenhouse, uh, the green green uh, the global uh, green uh, climate finance uh, fund uh, for coastal protection. But I think it is the right of those most vulnerable to seek for this protection from from the global community. From uh, you know back to the principle of polluter pays. Uh, so we are we are very fortunate to get the funding uh, from the Green uh, Climate Fund, uh, and we are starting to protect our islands, for shores, also doing reclamation, possibly raising the islands, um, so that we can protect our people and continue to live on the islands, and uh, so that we didn't have to be forced to move away. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you for your remark. Thanks for the, your remarks. I'm Jackie Westerman. I'm a researcher at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute here in Canberra. Um, we work, among other things, on women, peace and security and look at the connection between WPS and climate change. And seeing women are differently affected by climate change and um, subsequently the disasters happening, could you give some examples how Tuvalu includes women in creating more resistance to the effects of climate change? Yes, indeed. I, we, we fully recognize the contribution of women. They are mothers. In fact, they are leaders in their own communities. We have uh, uh, nine outer islands uh, communities away from the capital island of Funafuti. And most of the community's activities are to do with uh, sustainable development on health and education are led by women, uh, women committees, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So we fully recognize the contribution uh, by women in all these efforts. At the level, national level, we, we also work, most of the jobs, top jobs, are held by women anyway. And uh, you can see the two women here are champions in their own rights mm -hmm. to champion the, the contribution of the women in the church groups uh, led by the women. So, yes, indeed, we recognize that. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, I have a question. I'm a fan of student here at ANU. Uh, the question is, how do you feel uh, accepting the Australian aid that is partially funded, funded by the fossil fuel industry. We, we, have, we have been working with the Australian uh, government um, many, many years. And I think they have uh, contributed a lot to human development, to uh, sustainable development in Tuvalu. We appreciate that. Now, we, we have uh, uh, discussed, as I was saying in my uh, um, statement that uh, raising these issues directly with the Australian government, I've raised that uh, with, uh, with them, that uh, they, we cannot be regional partners uh, under this uh, Step Up uh, initiative. Um, genuine and durable partners, um, unless, uh, unless the government of Australia takes a more progressive is, uh, response to issues of climate change. And um, I'm glad that we, uh, we got the response from the Australian Prime Minister this, this afternoon that they are happy to work with Pacific leaders, including Tuvalu, on a dialogue to, to work out ways that we can uh, you know, close the gaps, in, so to speak, in this sort of uh, response to climate change. And I'm hopeful that we can do that. I know they have a uh, the policy on coal mining, um, but also on energy efficiency. Um, uh, but certainly, it's a very, very central policy of debate ongoing in Australia. We respect that. But I was uh, saying that we cannot be genuine partners, regional partners, bilateral partners, unless we, we see some progress in the policy of the Australian government. And this, these are things that we need to continue working and dialoguing, not shying away, but 
talking openly with the leaders of the Pacific and Australia as well. So uh, I think I also impress on the, the wealth of the technology and knowledge that we know is so present in Australia on, on solar uh, technology, on renewable energy, um, that is, you know, that is there. We, we know from the Pacific point of view, we in Tuvalu, it's available. But we perhaps only need uh, political leadership to move towards that, harnessing that, that wealth of uh, capacity in, in Australia. So we will continue to dialogue, to dialogue with them. But I am sure when things happen, I'm sure Australia, there will be a lot of lands here for, for people of Tuvalu to come and settle here. And then uh, I'm hearing already talks about visa uh, uh, arrangements to facilitate that. So thank you for your question. Prime Minister, thank you very much for a very illuminating address. Uh, you introduced our new High Commissioner to Tuvalu, and I wondered with you whether you'd like to care to elaborate on that initiative. Absolutely. I, we are very, very excited and happy that after many years, the uh, Australian government and uh, uh, Prime Minister Morrison has part of this step up initiative, the diplomatic connectivity. And now we have just last week welcomed the accreditation of the papers of Ambassador Murray, who is sitting right there. So uh, as she's part of her mission is to build up on this step up initiative, but also I promise her that every single Tuvaluan will support the Wallabies, <laughs> rugby, <laughs> not the All Blacks, but the rugby, the Wallabies. So thank you very much. Oh, by the way, uh, Foreign Minister of Malays will be visiting Tuvalu uh, in February, and we'll be opening officiating the new High Commission and also the foundation of the new residence and High Commission of the Australian High Commission in Tuvalu. Flying the flag of Australia there. Great stuff, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Prime Minister. It was a great opportunity to hear from your own words what's happening in Tuvalu. Um, we live on an island but it's a lot bigger. The Australia, I think, is the largest island in, 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 the, world. in the world. And it, I think it's really quite um, difficult, I think, for a lot of Australians to understand or have any in, in, indication of the impacts of climate change on a small island developing state. Um, one of the things that I was quite taken by recently was a couple of um, young people uh, were involved in some international event and they were telling the story from their own perspective, from their own, the impact of wherever they come from in one of the Pacific Islands. I know everyone would love to come to Tuvalu but not everyone may have the opportunity. <laughs> so perhaps as it's going to be a problem and a very important issue for the, for the young people of the world, would, uh, is it possible for some sort of um, video or some some visual sort of uh, indication that would be easily acceptable or easily accessible rather and possibly even a fundraising thing from climate change that could come out of the Tuvalu and the and and possibly through uh, the Poland to get Poland uh, negotiations because I think that's something that will bring the Tuvalu experience right to people's living rooms and particularly to young people who are going to face these challenges in their future as part of a, a member of a global community. Could you possibly get back to have a comment on that? Absolutely, ma'am. I think you've uh, raised a very, very important point. The audio visual, uh, I mean, pictures speak millions uh, more uh, words than, uh, pic than uh, words. So you are right. And I think we have materials that can be um, uh, shown and shared. Um, I, I, uh, our, my officials are taking note of this. We have uh, video clips of what happened in 2015 when we were hit by Cyclone uh, Pam. So this would be uh, very, very extremely useful to be shared uh, with, with the audience, with a wider uh, out, 
Australian uh, uh, audience in Australia. So you can uh, get really the feeling of how vulnerable and uh, destructive these events are on small islands like Tuvalu. But you're most welcome to come to Tuvalu. You know, don't come at one time. It will, you will sink the islands, but, but come. Most, we are having the forum in the uh, second week of August next year. We are, we are uh, hosting all the Pacific Island leaders. They will come there. And also I want to, uh, to encourage as much participation from the international community, especially our friends from Australia, New Zealand. But also I'm inviting the Secretary General of the United Nations and also the Executive Secretary of the Climate Change Convention. Uh, this will be a good, you know, feed in to what they are proposing as a Secretary General Summit on Climate Change in September. So if you have time, um, you are most welcome. Just let us know so we can uh, make preparations for your visit. Both students and professors, you're most welcome, especially from the ANU. We won't say to the, uh, that to other universities. <laughs> No, but seriously, it's there. The islands are there, I'm sure. I mean, it will be uh, more than enough to share our islands with you guys. Thank you very much. Yeah. But we'll share the video clips with you through the Australian High Commission. Thank you. So, Prime Minister, an honor, and you are a true uh, champion of, of the Pacific region in, in the world. So, I'm, I'm, um, my name is Per Alberg, and I'm the, proud to say that I'm the first ambassador of Sweden to Tuvalu. Absolutely. Non-resident, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Always an honor. Um, we haven't met for some time, Mr. Prime Minister. Could you, you mentioned the Green Climate Fund. And yes. one of the discussions that we have had in the past is access to the Green Climate Fund. Could you please elaborate a bit on that? What's the status now in terms of access or yes. difficulties? Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador, good to, to see you uh, again. And uh, it's really good to uh, uh, see friends around. Uh, but absolutely, for the Green Climate Fund, we were struggling for some time. Uh, we, uh, we, got, we prepared our proposal. I put together, you know, using the Tuvalu experts themselves, come together to write proposal on adaptation, on uh, coastal protection as adaptation to impacts of climate change. So we put this together into a proposal. I had the advantage of having worked in the, in the adaptation fund of the, the Kyoto Protocol uh, when we started off the operational mechanisms. So we got used those that knowledge and things like that, wrote a proposal, and then worked with our, with our partners, Australia and New Zealand, to advocate uh, advocates. And I was grateful for a, a former uh, chairman of the, the, the board of the Green, Green Climate Fund, MacDonald, he's Australian, and he's, he's now ambassador in New Zealand, I think. I mean, these personal connectivity connections are important. And, uh, and then we went to uh, the board. Luckily, we had the ambassador of Samoa, who's the rep of the small islands there, and very supportive. But you need to advocate with uh, uh, you know, partners like Japan, Australia, Switzerland, and all the EU, you know that. So we got the uh, approval, and we got the money uh, dispersed, uh, 52 million Australian dollars, to build the seawalls. Now, it's a different story when we actually start to implement because the implementing entities start to put on their own bureaucracies. And okay, we want to cut off 10, 10%, 13% as administrative charges. This is crazy, anyway. Um, but we worked through this and we are actually implementing building seawalls. So the money is there, it's dispersed, then we come to another hurdle, because I'm told you can only build seawalls, coastal protection, along the, the shores of the island. And then I am arguing, over the years, the islands was here, 
This is the size of the island. Because of the erosion, uh, sea level rise, and climate change, we are here. We need to rebuild. And, and then you get all sorts of arguments. No, that's reclamation. The concept of reclamation was not in your proposal. I, you know, you have to deal with these dynamics uh, in order to fully realize the usefulness of the, the approved uh, funding. So keep only built seawalls where the, your last coconut trees is going to fall, you build uh, seawalls there. So these are the difficulties, the challenges we are facing. But I think there is goodwill for us to continue to understand and build that understanding with the Green Climate Fund in the board, in the uh, governing board, and also in the actual uh, executive administrative uh, level. So, Ambassador, thank you. I want to ask you through you to also say something about the necessity of reclamation, not just coastal. And thank you for raising that question. Uh, we are facing uh, those challenges as well. I'm also talking to Australia. I visited with Australian uh, leaders. I will be raising the same issue in Poland as well. Uh, this is important for the vulnerable small islands whose land had been eroded into the sea over the many years. So we really need to restore that land. But otherwise, uh, other countries, small islands, are still you know, facing difficulties in accessing. But I think the funds, in fairness, have improved a lot as they gain experience and understanding over the, over the years. So thank you very much for your question. So it sounds like adaptation is needed in uh, some of the institutions as well. Um, so I think we've only got, uh, if, if they, just, just one last question, I think, Steve. Prime Minister, uh, I'm a journalist with German Press Agency. I wanted to ask your opinion about the global compact on migration and uh, what your views are in, in, in reference to uh, climate change uh, induced uh, migrants. And uh, because a lot of European countries are rejecting it, including Australia also has already said that they'll reject it. What are your views on that? And also, uh, you've touched a little bit on this. Uh, your message to COP24 in Poland, what's it going to be? Uh, will you be taking up the Pacific uh, Island insurance scheme? Will you be taking up that as one of the agendas? What uh, do you uh, want uh, the COP24 to achieve? Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, on the last one, yes, indeed, uh, it is. Uh, I think it's an um, imperative for the Pacific Island countries who, who don't really fall into uh, economies that can attract investments for insurance to have that Pacific Islands insurance cover. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the people will just be left to their own device to adapt and cope with the impacts of climate change, uh, including erosion on their lands, as I was saying. So we need that type of facility to be put in work in the Pacific. Uh, and I will be raising that in, in Poland. Um, but on the uh, compact, global compact of migration, the issue with uh, Tuvalu, we've been saying, we are not going to move away. And the people have, have been suggesting, why don't you have a fallback option so that we can establish a contingency plan maybe to relocate the people of Tuvalu somewhere in case all the islands are inundated. But at the moment, we still believe we can save the islands by seeking the intervention of the international community to build coastal uh, protective measures, even to raise the level of the islands uh, to you know, higher than what sea level rise. Because to say that we are moving to plan B, to be, uh, okay, we can migrate with dignity. Or what, I, I think this is a defeatist approach to say. And it's very, very dangerous at the moment, as far as I can see, as we try to conclude the actual operationalizing of the Paris Agreement. Because I think if we move that way, what's the point of adaptation? You may as well pack up. But this is very, very scary. 
if you have a strong cultural base, you know, uh, a cultural livelihood in, in the islands, you depend on your culture. You cannot displace, be displaced and take your culture with you, never. And then your rights to participate, your rights to contribute, to vote. What will happen to these rights? And that's why I'm very, very, as a leader, I'm very scared to even mention that this is an option for Tuvalu. And I will never say that. With the people of Tuvalu, we remain strong and stay on the, in their islands and continue uh, to be there in a su sustainable manner. And that is the whole idea uh, behind. We support the Global Compact on Migration, respecting the rights of the refugees, those under the convention. Of course, we, we should help all these people. But climate change uh, uh, displaced people, I think, deserve another uh, level of uh, uh, consideration so that the rights of those people displaced are properly protected. And that's why we are proposing a UN resolution, perhaps a convention in the future, on the rights of displaced people because of climate change. So that's the way I, 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 I see that. But Tuvalu fully supports this uh, initiative on compact, global compact on migration. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. Um, we have no time for further questions, but uh, I invite you to stay behind. Um, I, I'd just like uh, at this point just to um, thank very much the Prime Minister for um, not only his presentation but also his fantastic responses to the questions. Um, it's uh, an honour to actually have you um, visiting us here and it's been in education as well. So thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.